Hello everyone. Welcome to Theory of Programming. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to a very powerful problem solving technique called dynamic programming. We will try to learn the concepts of dynamic programming with the help of a very simple example of computing the nth Fibonacci number. So let's get started. So what is dynamic programming? Dynamic programming is a method to solve complex problem by breaking it down to smaller sub problems. How does that help? Well, when you solve these smaller subproblems, you store its solution so that when you hit the same exact subproblem next time, you already have the solution ready. So the original problem must have two characteristics if you want to have a DP based solution for it. The first is optimal substructure. As I said before, we will break down the complex problem into smaller subproblems and solve them. But in the end, what you care about is the solution to the original problem. So the optimal solutions to the sub problem should be usable to construct the optimal solutions of the original problem. This is called the optimal substructure property. Second, overlapping sub problems. As I said before, we're going to store the solutions of the sub problems we solve and try to reuse them later when we hit the same sub problem. But that is helpful only when you're required to solve a subproblem again and again. This is called the overlapping subproblem property. It is totally okay if you don't understand these terms just yet. We will understand them better when we show how the nth Fibonacci number problem shows these characteristics. As you might already know, the nth Fibonacci number equals to the n minus 1 Fibonacci number plus the n minus 2nd Fibonacci number. This formula itself proves its optimal substructure property. How? The subproblems are actually fn minus 1 and fn minus 2. Now, your original problem was fn, but by solving smaller versions of it, which is fn minus 1 and fn minus 2, you are able to get fn, the original problem. So, you are able to use the solutions of the subproblems or smaller versions of the original problem to compute the optimal solution to the original problem. This is simply nothing but optimal substructure property. So the code for a naive approach solution looks like this. Very simple, but terrible at performance. Why? Because it has exponential time complexity. That can be proved. Let's say Tn was the time it takes to compute the nth Fibonacci number. So Tn equals to Tn minus 1 plus Tn minus 2 plus C, some constant time. Now, since n minus 1 is larger than n minus 2, we can claim that Tn minus 1, the time it takes to compute the n minus 1th Fibonacci number, would be something greater than Tn minus 2, the time it takes to compute the n minus 2nd Fibonacci number. So using that, we can state that Tn would at least be greater than 2 times of Tn minus 2. And progressively simplifying this equation, we can write Tn minus 2 as 2 times of Tn minus 4. So we are counting down to n in steps of 2. So how many steps would it take in total? n by 2. So Tn would at least be as big as 2 to the power of n by 2, which means Tn, the time it takes to compute the nth Fibonacci number, is theta of 2 to the power of n. That's exponential. Now, let us look at this problem from another perspective. Let's say you wanted to compute the 6th Fibonacci number. So that would be f of 6. And as per the algorithm, f of 6 would call f of 5 and f of 4. And f of 5 would call f of 4 and f of 3, and so on. If you look at this recursion tree closely, you'd notice that we are actually calling f of 3 multiple times. We call f of 3, 1, 2, 3, 3 times. And similarly, f of 4, we call f of 4, 1, and 2, 2 times. This is nothing but overlapping subproblem property. Your original problem was to compute f of 6, and your subproblems were f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, so on. And in your algorithm to compute f of 6, you're computing f of 3, f of 4 multiple times, which means you're computing the solution of the subproblem again and again. Now we have shown that the nth Fibonacci number problem has optimal substructure property and overlapping subproblems property. Let's see how we can make this faster using dynamic programming. So, new term memoization. Memoization is basically caching the results of each function call. 
So when the function gets called with a certain input, we compute the result and store it. So that when the same function gets called with the same input, we simply return that stored result. This is the code for the memoized version of the naive algorithm we saw earlier. Let's say this method was called for f of 3 here. What do we do? Since I haven't already computed f for n equals to 3, I compute it and I store it in my cache. So the next time I'm required to call f for n equals to 3, which would be here, I already have the result. So I simply return it. If you're using a dictionary, then adding and querying take constant time. So the second call to f of 3 doesn't cost me anything. It takes constant time. And as a result, these grayed out function calls f of 2 and f of 1 don't even happen. In this figure, the function calls denoted in green circles are the function calls which take constant amount of time. And the grayed ones are the function calls which don't even happen because you return early somewhere up in the recursion tree. So as you can see, by using memoization, we've cut down our recursion tree by a great deal. So how fast is this algorithm? Its time complexity is linear. How? If you notice, every right child, which represents the second recursive call in the formula, takes only constant time because its result would already be known. So the green nodes are the function calls which actually take constant amount of time. Please note that f of 1 and f of 2 also take constant amount of time because they are the base case. So Tn, which is the time taken to compute the nth Fibonacci number, becomes Tn minus 1, the time taken to compute the n minus 1th Fibonacci number, plus a constant. Now we can write Tn minus 1 as Tn minus 2 plus c. That would make Tn equals to Tn minus 2 plus 2c. And if we keep simplifying this similarly, we get Tn equals to nc, which means Tn equals to order of n. So just by applying memoization, we've turned an algorithm which takes exponential time to a linear one. Bottom-up approach is another approach to write dynamic programming-based algorithms. As the name suggests, you do things bottom-up. By bottom, we mean the smallest subproblem, and by up, we mean the original problem. So you start by solving the smallest subproblem and keep solving progressively larger subproblems until you reach the original solution. In the nth Fibonacci number, for example, the smallest subproblems were f of 1 and f of 2. So what is the next smallest subproblem? That would be f of 3. So do we have enough data to compute f of 3? Yes. We computed f of 1 and f of 2 and already have them stored. Oh, and please note, we are still computing the subproblems and storing them. So when you're computing the third Fibonacci number, you'd simply use the solution for the second Fibonacci number and the first Fibonacci number. Then after the third Fibonacci number, the next bigger subproblem is the fourth Fibonacci number. Do we have enough data to compute the fourth Fibonacci number? Yes. We just computed the third Fibonacci number and we already know what the second Fibonacci number is. So in this manner, you work your way up to the nth Fibonacci number. This is the code for computing the nth Fibonacci number using a bottom-up based approach. Here, we are using a simple array to store our solutions to subproblems. You can use a dictionary if you want. When i equals to 3, I compute the third Fibonacci number and use that when i equals to 4 to compute the fourth Fibonacci number and use that to compute the fifth Fibonacci number when i equals to 5, and so on. So how fast is this algorithm? This also has linear time complexity. Why? You have a loop running from 3 to n, with that takes order of n time, and you do constant amount of work inside the loop. So it's order of n, as simple as that. You don't need the tree on the right-hand side to understand this. If this tree is confusing you, you can ignore it. But what it's trying to say is that you're actually doing the same amount of work in the bottom-up approach as you would do in the memoization approach. So to compute Fib3, you query Fib2 and Fib1 in constant time. And to compute Fib4, you query Fib3 and Fib2 in constant time, and so on. If you notice, you have the same exact number of nodes in this tree as you've seen in the recursion tree for memoization. So the algorithms written by bottom-up approach and memoization have the exact same time complexities.
Well, the bottom-up approach is slightly faster in reality because you don't have the overhead of function calls, but it will have the exact same worst case complexity as the memoized version. So you can choose any of the approaches. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so this is your guiding light to solving DP problems. There are four steps to follow. First, you define your sub problem. What are the hints to do that? Break down your original problem into smaller parts. You need to guide your mind to think about what could be a smaller version of the original problem. Another hint to do this is to look at some trivial or obvious cases. In the example of Fibonacci, this was f of 1 and f of 2. This was actually telling you that a smaller Fibonacci number is your subproblem. Second, you define the relation between subproblems. A hint to do this is to see the relationship between the smallest subproblem and the next smallest subproblem. So, in the case of Fibonacci, this would mean the relationship between f1, f2, and f3, which is f3 equals to f2 plus f1. Third, you define the recurrent relationship which solves the actual problem. A hint to do this is to generalize the relationship you found in the previous step for n. In the case of Fibonacci, this would be the formula fn equals to fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. Once you define a recurrence, try validating it for some random test cases. Fourth, you write a DP based algorithm to solve the recurrence problem. You can do this by either applying memoization or taking the bottom up approach. The example of Fibonacci was actually easy because the third step was already done for you when you were given the formula fn equals to fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. So you didn't have to actually do the first three steps. But the real difficulty in solving a dynamic programming problem involves in cracking down the first three steps. Step four is actually pretty easy. Your skill in solving dynamic programming problems is based on how good are you at step one to three and not based on how good you are at step four. In fact, if you're asked a dynamic programming question in an interview, what the interviewer really wants you to do is to figure out that recurrence relation in step three. If you get that right, the interviewer might even ask you to skip step four. That being said, the complexity of dynamic programming based algorithms can be easily computed by using this formula. It is the number of subproblems you actually solve times the time it takes to solve a subproblem. Remember that you actually solve a subproblem only once, and the subsequent calls to that subproblem are actually free. So, that is what I meant by the number of subproblems you actually solve. I hope this has given you an idea of dynamic programming. In the coming videos for dynamic programming, what we're going to do is use these exact four steps to build the DP solution for whatever problem we will talk about. This will strengthen your general approach to solve dynamic programming problems and give you more confidence. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you like the content on my channel, please hit the subscribe button. Keep practicing and happy coding.